Um, Dr. Moskowitz, what is, there was a phrase that Dr. Pinterbaum threw out there, which was uh, transplant ineligible. I want to go back to that. What is, what is your definition of transplant ineligible when considering a patient for autologous transplant? Well, first I will say that I think everybody is transplant eligible. So you disagree with her a priori? Well, I, you can become transplant ineligible, implying that you might not respond to the salvage treatment that we give you. What about a 75 or 80 year old patient? Well, I mean, you know, Jonathan, I don't take care of 75 or 80 year old <laughs> patients with Hodge. I sent them to Hamlin over there. But the, um, but- in, I, I, I think you've been served, but I'm not quite <laughs> sure how. But, but I think, you know, if we, if we use the, um, the non-Hodgkin lymphoma database, where the median age of being transplanted is 65, mm -hmm. um, and we already learned that only 10% of patients with Hodgkin lymphoma are older than the age of 60, that means probably only about 2 or 3% are older than the age of 80, we'll make believe we'll just exclude those patients for now, and let's just say everybody's transplant eligible. Mm -hmm. And we're going to give them chemotherapy X, and those patients will either respond to that treatment or not respond to that treatment. If they do not respond to that treatment, they are by definition transplant ineligible at this particular point. It doesn't mean we can't get them back into the loop, but you know, now I would say that the Hodgkin lymphoma clock has started, the, uh, their life clock. All right, well, how would you define an inadequate response to proceed to autologous transplantation? Would you call it partial response, stable disease, progressive disease, pet positivity? We've classically defined it as a, a less than 50% reduction in the tumor volume, and we've mm -hmm. now added in the fly in the ointment, if you will, of a, of a functional imaging test, the PET scan, which is probably quite important to convert to a normal PET scan based on data that we've looked at prior to transplant. And the question is, should that be your goal? Should you give additional therapy to convert a PET scan to a negative result because the long-term outcome will be better, or is that a marker of just worse biology? Well, certainly less than a partial response by CT that is still PET positive. To answer your question, I would consider that failing. Okay. Now, can, can you recap the recent study from your institution exploring the role of functional imaging pre-autologous transplant? Well, I, I think once again, I'm going to answer this somewhat vaguely. We are at a, we are at a referral center. Um, in my opinion, patients who have a negative PET scan prior to transplantation have a tripling of their survival. It doesn't mean that the patient with a positive PET scan is um, no longer curable. It just means that the patients with a negative PET scan are much more likely to be cured. Um, let's remember, these are Hodgkin lymphoma patients. The median age is 29, as Jonathan said. They haven't had that much treatment thus far. Just because they failed salvage chemotherapy for two cycles doesn't mean that we can't give them something else, which is what we did in this study. And actually, what we did was exactly what Dr. Freeberg and I do, um, although not necessarily in the same order. Um, we gave ICE chemotherapy or treatment A. If the PET scan was negative, we took the patients directly to transplant, and they had a three out of four chance of being cured. If their PET scan was positive, however, we crossed them over to Jonathan's treatment program, the outpatient program, Half of those patients went into remission, and three of the three of four of four of those patients were cured. So I think the take-home message is that it doesn't matter how you get into remission. If it's doable, um, the patient will have a better outcome. But it doesn't mean we will not transplant you if you have a partial response that's pet avid, because one in three patients are cured. All right. So all of this, notwithstanding, uh, there's a lot of data in the midst of all of this. Can somebody draw me a roadmap? Under what circumstances would you proceed to autologous transplant with a PET positive patient as opposed to a different line of therapy? Who wants to pick that up? I, I have a patient right now that this is somewhat germane to, so it's been on my mind. And I think that uh, you know there are a subset of patients, as Craig implied, that if you go through a couple of rounds of chemotherapy in the salvage setting still may be PET positive at the end. Uh, we know that a subset of those patients with autologous transplant may enjoy prolonged remissions. That's clearly a group of patients where one might think about even more aggressive approaches like allogeneic transplant, but not everybody has that option. You may not have a donor. There may be some other logistical concerns that make allogeneic transplant an impossibility. And if you're looking at a young patient who's 32 years old, 
who has some residual pedividity going into an autologous transplant and doesn't have an allogeneic donor, I still certainly refer those patients for autologous transplant, recognizing that the outcome isn't optimal, but is probably still their best option. Is that your roadmap too? Yes, pretty much. I, I throw out, so I guess I'm from the West Coast, so I get to be the outlier here, but I, I would throw out one thing, and that is what's the role of biopsy in that situation? Perhaps the ones that do well, they're false positive pets. They really don't have disease. They really are in CR. Uh, that may, that we'll may never be. know. You're right. I think the difference, the issue why that's so difficult in Hodgkin lymphoma is that many times this is in the mediastinum. The patients have been radiated. It's a, it would be a major procedure. You could not do a needle biopsy in these patients. You probably have to do an open biopsy, and that's probably not worth it. But to taking Jonathan's point one step further, it, once again, it's much different if, if Jonathan's patient has residual pedividity in a neck or an axillary lymph node, where as part of the transplant program, that patient's going to be radiated, as opposed to that patient having a, a lump in their lumbar sacral spine. Mm -hmm. So I think that it, it's a clinical judgment uh, on what we do, but I think that once again, for the f for the folks who uh, this is educational, it is Hodgkin lymphoma. We get many chances to cure these patients. We just want, even with second line treatment, we still want to cure the patients with the least amount of treatment, if at all possible. So the the difficulty of getting the surgical biopsy really is one of the factors that that weighs into it. And it would be a delay. I mean, if you're going to put a patient through, for example, a uh, a uh, Chamberlain procedure for to do a biopsy in the mediastinum in someone who's got active Hodgkin lymphoma, they're going to be down for four or five weeks, and then you'll repeat the imaging, and now you'll see a lump in the middle of their, in their lung. It's just not worth it. And keep in mind, these patients, because of our rule that, that Paul mentioned earlier, th these patients all have had a biopsy to prove that the pedividity at recurrence was Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay. So it may only be six weeks or eight weeks that have gone by since you've already uh, done your last biopsy. Mm -hmm.